WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive Broadcasting from the homeland and the homestead here at WNST in beautiful Towson. Make sure you're setting your dial at the AM 1570 and uh, give us a little preset on the radio here this week as we present the greatest hits of Super Bowl Radio Row as we're locked out of Super Bowl. Is this 57? I mean, I uh, Luke, I've been going through all these discs, and they say 38, 41. And the only way I can figure it out is I have to add to 35 or subtract from 47 to figure out what Super Bowl 41 really represented to say. All right, so 41 was 6 plus <laughs> 01 is 07. So that's a Tom Brady one. I know that. And I'm like, okay, 07, 07. Oh, that was Miami. That wasn't Tom Brady. That was the Peyton Manning one. So I have to, like, I associate the games with Super Bowl radio row guests. I, I associate them with halftime artists. And... You know, I guess from time to time, the uh, cast of characters and whether we were in the game or not or how close we came to being in the game, including the Prince Purple Rain game, where we still had that disappointment to Peyton Manning. But seeing the bullies of Baltimore come back to life on Sunday night and bringing back uh, my childhood and ghosts of uh, Super Bowl past 22 years have passed now, I guess, for all of us that uh, remember this. It, it was really something to see it feeded and celebrated. Now, I was at the event down at the Meyerhoff uh, back in May before Goose passed, but I it, it really was um, – it brought a tear to my eye. You know what I mean? I think it was intended to do that, and um, it was very, very emotional. And obviously when they shot this thing, Goose dying a couple of weeks later changed the whole trajectory of, of the documentary, I think. It did, but I think it's also lovely in a way that it provided this epilogue for him and his family. I mean, they even showed the the hard knocks footage of he and his wife having their third child, which was you know right around that time when hard knocks was being you know I guess probably right before uh, it was filmed in the summer of '01. But I mean, just what a fun trip down memory lane! And I you know this is very unique for me. I've covered the Ravens for a long time now, but in 2000. I was a 17-year-old who was a, a senior in high school. My generation had grown up without NFL football in, in the city of Baltimore. So I think what's so beautiful, uh, and it's funny to use the word beautiful to describe the 2000 Ravens when you really think about it because of you know the way they talk trash and they were so brash and they played this nasty defense. And you, know, you look at it today and you'd say, my goodness, they'd be thrown out of the league. You know, they'd be penalized every other play. Uh, but... I think what makes it so unique is, and this is really true of any special team, any championship team, when you really think about it, but I think the the 2000 Ravens, because of the generational gap that was created, it they meant something a little bit different to everybody. I mean, I think back, and I'm just going to use my own personal experience here for a moment, so humor me, but I think of my grandparents who grew up with the Colts you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then as things were going south with Robert Ursay, and I can recall them saying that when it first came out that the Browns were moving to Baltimore, that, you know, they were happy for me. They were happy for my dad, but they were done with the NFL. And there were plenty of folks who uh, adhered to that. And that was their choice. And that was their I'm feeling them on this particular Monday yeah. morning. Yeah. But at the same time, <laughs> but they said this. But what was funny, Nestor, and maybe not so much in 96 and 97, but as time went on, every time we'd bring up the Ravens, boy, they knew everything about them. You know, they, oh, so their they world stopped at, at 1 o'clock. Right, right. We used to say around here at the beginning, because NST was born in August yeah. of, of 98, right? We would say around here, there's a train wreck every Sunday at 1 o'clock. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, And everybody in the community heard the call or, or the call. Back then, you know, I, I guess back yeah. in 2001 at that time, but I, it's very, very hard to portray to people who did not live through it, who right. are not here for it, all of the miracles that the franchise existed, but that they, they, the, the Ravens are established now, uh, you know, a quarter of a century later, right? Yeah. Not just not established, but like, no one thought the team in the purple Barney uniforms could even win the Super Bowl. You know, like, right, literally. right. Well, yeah. And, and I, you know, just to finish my thought, you know, there's my grandparents, there's my father who was in his 40s and approaching 50 years of age when, when the Ravens came to town. And, you know, my, I, I can still to this day, you know, my mom talking about how 
my dad cried that morning, as many Baltimore sports fans, as many Colts fans did uh, in March of 1984. I saw Even, my father cry twice. Yeah. That was once. Yeah. Uh, one of so, the two. So he grew up, you know, obviously he had so many great memories uh, of the Colts. He was born in 1951, but you know, he, he, he had a long gap there. And in the meantime, he had children who he wanted to experience that with. And my dad and I grew up loving the Orioles, but there was no football. I mean, you know, there was the Stallions and there was hope of expansion and all the different stories that we can all remember now vividly all these years later. But uh, for, for him to then have a second team and then for him to be able to enjoy that with his children. And so I think about that generation. And then you know, someone like me, you know, I was a few months old when the Colts left town and grew up with the Orioles. And that was it until I was 13 years old. So and having, but friends. when you were twelve, you never thought there would be a team here because your right, dad was right. probably I mean, resigned there, to it. You know, yeah, we, there was. We, a, I was on the radio five years, and like I didn't really believe that it, we were getting a team. I believed we would be forever screwed by the NFL, which right. is another missive for this week as well. But I, it, it's, it, it is, it was a miracle to old people it, and to what, people. I wasn't old. I was in my, you know, I was in my twenties, right? right? But like. I never thought we would get a team. I just didn't think the gods and the powers that be would allow it, like literally. Yeah, especially when Carolina and Jacksonville got the expansion teams. I mean, it, that really felt like, even as someone who, I was a kid, I didn't know, understand, you know, the Maryland Stadium Authority and, you know, the lottery and all the different, you know, all it the things It would be as unlikely it, but... as me saying to you, we're going to get an NHL or an NBA team yeah, now. I mean, just laugh at it now, right? I mean, it'd be yeah. great, you know, I'd, I'd love that for the city, but it would I be mean, it would be something for a kid to say yeah. or someone very naive sure. would say it was like old school phone callers for me that would right. say, hey, you know, how many phone callers called me. Hey, Nancy, you think we can get a hockey team? No, yeah. we can't. You know, right. I can give you so, a million and one economic reasons. But the answer to could we get a team for your grandparents was. Luke, I love you. Roxy, I love you. You know, hold your Justin, breath. I love right. you. But we're just, it, it, there is no Santa Claus. We're never going to get a team here. So, it, like, that, I come from the background of that. So, this mm -hmm. is still very, and I can put my head around where your grandparents were and where my sure. mother was, you know, at sure, that time. Sure, sure. So, I, I think the, the commonality there, and even someone who was a teenager and, and didn't know any better, but, you know, when, when you're thinking about, and, I really started remembering in the late 80s. So, you know, the late 80s into the, the mid 90s, you know, OK, the box and the Bengals for a minute and expansion and give Baltimore the ball and the Saints and Dolphins having the exhibition game at uh, on 33rd Street. And but e even as I was 12 or 13 years old, it started feeling more and more impossible. So the, the common thread there between all those generations I just mentioned, and again, that's my experience, but I think a lot of people, you know, feel different ways at different ages it really did feel impossible. And for just the Ravens themselves in their fifth season, after having watched them in 96 and 97 and 98, and it was better in 99, but still not particularly good. There was such a sense of it being impossible, such a sense for these 2000 Ravens and, and what made their personality. I think why people locally took such a liking to them, besides the fact that they were just a kick-ass defense and really good was there was all along this sense of, Baltimore doesn't belong here. The Ravens don't belong here. Uh, the, the fact that they even have a team, let alone the fact that they're in the playoffs and winning in this ugliest sin style where, I mean, did you watch them earlier this year? They went five straight games without scoring a touchdown. So for the Ravens to have the personality that they had, which uh, as the, as the, the documentary laid out, everyone outside of Baltimore hated for any number of reasons from Ray Lewis in Atlanta to just, the fact that you know they moved a team out of Cleveland and 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 everything, yep, there was such trash talkers. I, I think there was just there was such a sense of whoever you are, whatever your age was, following this team and then the team itself that they didn't belong. And the NFL, you know, they weren't a welcome party, right? I mean, the NFL didn't want Baltimore. Uh, Paul Tagliabue had made that very obvious a couple years before that. So everything about this just seemed like it was wrong from an outsider's perspective, but boy, it was right for Baltimore. And you just look at this team and you know, I've said this, I had this conversation not long ago with my brother-in-law, as you know, big Eagles fan, don't want to rehash that. And people don't care about Philly right now, but I said to him when the Eagles won five years ago, when they won in that impossible way with 
with Nick Foles and, and everything that they did and so many former Ravens, as you and I talked about even recently, I said to him, the Eagles could win five more Super Bowls over the next 20 years and be the next Patriots. Nothing will ever feel like that first one for you. And I got to cover <laughs> Super Bowl 47 in New Orleans. And I, I, I've gotten to know so many of those players and covered them and, and had this amazing opportunity that 2012 team, as special as it was, and you know, you wrote a book on both teams. For me personally, and I'm speaking more as Luke Jones, a 17-year-old Baltimore football fan, nothing ever will, will come close to that. As special as 2012 was, nothing that's happened since or will ever happen in the future will top or match that 2000 Ravens team. And, you know, for, Dude, for you're my make generation, me cry, man, yeah, like seriously, I, I'm, not, I'm not even trying to be overly mushy about it. That's just how I feel about it. And, and it's I think true. So, it's true. Hey, so dude, many, I, I'm yeah. another generation of life or ahead of you. Yeah. And I can, you know, being where I am at this point with the franchise and with the city and with the empty seats and just with mm -hmm. the lies and the offensive, we're going to help pick our offense. And then seeing what the, Covering that other team from the inside with a ring and a book and seeing what Brian Billick was made of and Rod Woodson is made yeah. of and Tony Saragusa was made of and Jack Del Rio is made of and Marvin Lewis is made of. And I mean, I know these men and, you know, from my perspective. I took a powder after the first segment because I could see where it was going when it started with Goose's funeral. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I said to myself. I feel like I should text Goose and say hello to Goose. You know what I mean? See yeah. how he's doing. Because he's like alive to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's not – he wasn't a, a cartoon character to me, you know. Yeah. Uh, seeing that stuff with him and Keith Mills with his show by then. His show started with me in, mm -hmm. in 97, 98 when he came in here. And, um, and, and I, I think the piece itself – and I, I said this to my wife walking out that night because my wife and I had a drive back to the county. We had just moved to the county after the actual live event. It was very obvious. I mean, I went down, did the confetti. I said hello to Marvin, but I didn't talk to anybody that night. I, I fist bumped Jack. It was right about the time Jack was having his problems with being a Trumper, for lack of better expression. Right. Whatever he said about the cops, that was nuts. Uh, it was about a week or two before that because it was mini camp that happened or training camp in, in, in June that that happened. And Jack and I were going to grab dinner and this and that. I left and I said to my wife, I'm like, Goose stole the show. Yeah. Goose stole the show on the stage that night. Goose stole the show. And I thought, that, you know, that that's the interesting fallout of all of this is there's Hall of Famers up there coaches guys that went on made a lot more money than goose were more decorated goose was the star of the team not in like ray lewis was the star of the team right but sure. but when it comes to personality for it and carrying the torch for it and i said that to my wife and i know i said that to you back in june when he died because we had a couple moments mm -hmm. in the aftermath of that um and I was looking for all those tapes and I found him singing those Christmas songs. <laughs> Tear me <laughs> up, man. But um, I, I, I thought that that was an interesting legacy for that team is that Goose would be the, the heavy and the spokesperson for it and the most beloved, right? I mean, we love Ray. We love the team. I love Coach Billick. I love, I have, we all have special relationships and like that. But Goose... The minute he walked out, he owned the crowd. He owned the stage that night. And his passing, uh, I'm, I'm sure it made it tough for the producers. And at some point, I may have him on. Uh, I was working to do that last week when all hell broke loose with the NFL and the, the Radio Row stuff. But for me, with Goose, having him feed it in that way, it brought some sort of um, depth and perspective in a way that didn't the night of the event, the night of the event, it was confetti and it was all over again. It was look at what they did and look at what they did. The film was much more sober than that. In yeah, the end, it was, but I, right. It, it, and it was, and obviously the timing of it, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, irony, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's just, but you know, Saragusa, I mean, Goose just resonated. I mean, I, I mentioned the theme of everything about this wasn't supposed to happen. I mean, this guy was an undrafted 
free agent out of Pitt in 1990. I mean, he played in Indianapolis. Yeah. He played in Indianapolis for years. I mean, that's where he made his hay as an NFL player. And then he winds up in Baltimore and and becomes this you know, late 90s version of Art Donovan. And uh, I mean, there was just, you know, there, were, there was a charm to that. I mean, not that it, you would say he's this charming individual overall. I mean, he's rough around the edges and, and could be abrasive and all that. But boy, for I mean, real, he just for real yeah. in real life. For I mean, real. He, he really fit. He fit the personality of the city, the fan base, and that football team at that point in time. And, I mean, he wasn't alone, and he'd be the first to tell you that. But, yeah, he had a, a way of, as he did on that night and as he did in this uh, documentary, even even without the what was clearly a, a greater emphasis on him giving the, the, the tragedy of him passing away shortly after uh, the reunion. But, you know, it just uh, – I mean, he just he, – he fit. And – Again, this goes back to as much as all of this wasn't supposed to happen in so many different ways. I mean, here's this loud, obnoxious, big guy, you know, Jersey native who said, eh, why not? You know, why aren't why can't we be here? And, and you know, so many other guys on that team that just he uh, came out to the that. van and drank beer with us. Yeah. And threw beer cans at Redskins fans in the parking lot. Like, <laughs> this, like I literally, this happened for real. I mean, I'll never forget him putting his meat hook around me in Denver at a Mile High yeah. Stadium and telling me he loved me after he got conked in the head that day. I had a concussion. So, uh, uh, Luke Jones is here. He is Baltimore Luke. You can find him uh, anywhere uh, but Radio Row this week. We're going to have a whole lot of best of here this week and a whole lot of memories. And, you know, you and I have had a chance to sit down with um, Stokely and, and – John Ogden, um, you were not a part of the sit down I had with Trent Dilfer in 2006 in Detroit. All of these pieces are going to air this week. They're going to appear at Baltimore Positive this week. Um, I have a 2009 piece, extended piece, 25 minutes with Ray Lewis in Tampa, where the subject was him leaving the franchise. Mm-hmm. So we were in the middle of this with Lamar at this point. And there's actually a point where we asked Joe Montana what Ray Lewis should do. And Joe, because he went to Kansas City famously at the end right. of his career, he, he said, I would tell Ray to go. So I'm airing stuff this week that never would have made it on the air had we been in Glendale and Phoenix this week. But we're having our own issues here this week. But part of this for for you and I is, Goose sat down with me on Radio Row in Jacksonville. He sat down with me on Radio Row in Phoenix uh, at different points. Shannon Sharp sat down with me every year. So I have all of these pieces, Marvin, you know, all of these pieces put together from that team. And I'm so proud of that. And I'm so um, emotionally attached to that team and always will be. And in a way that you put it much more eloquently than I can you know, as Barry White once sang, my first, my last, my everything. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, again, taking nothing away from the 2012 team that had such a, a great story itself. But oh, it's, especially for me, because... And a bigger parade, not, as I told Joe Flacco. Which no true. question. No question. <laughs> but for, for me, someone my age, and I'm not making this about me, but my generation, you got to remember, again... I was born in October of 83. I was born literally two weeks before the Orioles last won the World Series. I'm 39 years old now. That's how long it's been for the Orioles. So did not grow up with those glory days, just grew up with the stories of it. And I cherish those stories, but it's not the same as experiencing it yourself. So the the Ravens in 2000 and then the Terps in 2002, because I grew up, you know, a Maryland basketball fan as well. Not, not as lucrative as, as the NFL and baseball, but certainly uh, appreciate that. But that chance to celebrate and you know you mentioned it w- with tony saragusa but just think about for everyone it's as much as you love the team and this is again me getting a little more philosophical as i get older it's really about who you experience these games with you know it going to going to your father go with your father or your mother or your grandpa or your grandma or your aunt or your uncle to 33rd street or camden yards or uh you know watching the colts watching the ravens i mean whatever you know, whatever your age is, whenever you grew up, I mean, you know, when you see that and Goose is just, you know, the the most recent, you know, member of that team that we've lost, that there've been others uh, and other members of the organization. But you know, I thought about my dad, you know, throughout that, I, I could think about every single significant moment. My my one complaint uh, of of the thirty for thirty, and they did a fantastic job. I would have liked a, li- a a few minutes spent on the week two win over Jacksonville. Uh, as you know, I, I did my 
greatest regular season moments in Ravens history uh, a couple years ago during the pandemic. And that was number one for me because of what that meant symbolically beating Jacksonville. To me, that was the moment the Ravens arrived as a legitimate NFL team. By the way, it was anyway. the day we went on the radio the next day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so we've so, been on the radio continuously as right. WNST from September 10th of 2000, uh, literally go. the day after. So, yeah, there you go. But but that that, you know, again, a minor complaint, that constructive criticism there. Just uh, my personal opinion. I think that moment was that significant. That it changed the franchise. It. Yeah. But it was different because it didn't it went against the narrative of the Ravens being dominant defensively because they gave up 36, 36 points that day, you know, which which was was strange. But. Every significant moment from, you know, I think, uh, of Dilfer throwing the pick six late in the Tennessee game in the regular season and then coming back and every moment of the playoffs. I mean, you know, I, I have these memories of where I was, what what we had for the, for the, the game spread that day, sitting in the <laughs> living room, what, what we had to eat. All of that. I mean, I, I was only 17, so I wasn't drinking beer, but I can tell you what beer my dad was drinking that day. And uh, I mean, you just all those different memories just come flat. Come That Charger back. game blows me away because I had a really special experience that night. Yeah. You know, when they made the playoffs mm -hmm. and like it was raining and cold. And I went to Mother's that night after the game and like I didn't even live downtown, but I just it was one of those really special nights in the way that look beating Denver special when sure. Ray Lewis caught the ball. I was with Kevin Eck in the upper deck in Nashville, jumping up and down in Oakland. I was in the box with the mother's group. I talk about it all the time. I was on the field when Sarah goose had the Mickey mouse shirt on and, mm -hmm. and they were celebrating the AFC trophy. I was taking pictures next to the photographer that shot that. So, so much of it, I kept stopping, the thing and saying to my wife, man, I was on the field for that. Yeah. When Patrick Johnson caught that touchdown in Nashville, there's a picture of me ducking as he caught the pass. I have a picture of that. I was wearing, and you know this is a period piece, right? I was wearing the purple camouflage pants. How about that? There you go. Right? Yeah. My dad, my dad owned a pair of those, so of I, course I, he did. Lots of people did it, and the ones you said they didn't, they <laughs> lied, right? I mean, I mean, everyone had them back. They were the our Zubaz. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was a, it was on the heels of, of Bills fans wearing those for half a decade. So, no, I mean, it was just a, a, every moment about that, and and that's what just made this so fun. Uh, you know, I, I think we all think back to the obvious memories, you know, the obvious moments, but, you know, even, even the more subtle ones. I mean, I think of some of the games I went to that year. I, I went to the game down at FedEx field where goose talked about how he was backed up, which I had not heard that story before. So I thought that was, that all was I remember Steven Davis, stiff arm and Rod Woods, yeah. in the hall of famer running him over. That's all well, I, remember. I, I remember. I lost a bet with, with a, a girl that I went to that game with for, from my high school. And uh, I had to wear a champ Bailey Jersey to school the next Ooh. day, which everyone at my high school knew I was the biggest Ravens fan around. And, Boy, that was that was something. That was a scene. I've never heard this story. I'm getting yeah. deep dark secrets. I honest I know. honestly hadn't even really thought How about have I it. I spent it, 15 it. radio rows and, and nights in <laughs> hotel rooms and beer and like even, and I've never heard that story from you. Even my you know, that that was my senior senior year of high school and I you know, I was on the football team. Even my football coach caught wind of that and heard Luke, I heard you were wearing a Champ Bailey jersey today. I was like, Coach, I don't want to talk about it. It's why you no. don't make those kind of bets. I lost a bet with Travis Taylor <laughs> over the Terps. Florida game. I had to wear his helmet. Yeah, at the barn. <laughs> I go. had to wear a Florida Gator helmet. So right. So so I mean, it's just. But all these, you know, it, it's the big memories, but it's also the little memories. And this is again, this is true throughout your, your life as a sports fan. But for those championship teams specifically, for this to come to life, for for them to have, you know, the the event that they did, and, and to use so much of that footage and so many of these uh, interviews with so many of the key players. I mean, it's just. It's fun. It, it brings it to life. And, you know, what's crazy about it, you know, as we were talking about the generations of, you know, our parents and grandparents to, you know, me, now I think about, and I was seeing this even on Twitter, uh, and I was tweeting a little bit uh, as the, I didn't want to tweet too much, uh, but I was tweeting a few times, you know, made met a shout out to Rob, Rob Burnett, who should have made the Pro Bowl that year. That's how great he was and uh, how big of a part he was of that. I have a picture defense. of him. We gave him a grass skirt out at the bar. He was he was terrific that year. Go back and look. I mean, the sacks, the forced fumbles, fumble recoveries, quarterback hits. He was uh, dominant. Yeah, he he really was. And by the way, he was a first-team All-Pro that year. So at least the, the Associated Press gave him the nod, even if the Pro Bowl uh, did not. But, you know, I, 
I, I think what was neat about seeing this on Twitter was, I mean, you think about it, this was 23 years ago now. There are even some prominent Ravens fans. And when I say prominent Ravens fans, younger fans who just have a following, right? They're, you know, the X's and O's film junkie types or just super fans or whatever. Seeing some of them make mention of they weren't alive when the Ravens won that Super Bowl in 2000. They're, they're only 20 or 21 or maybe they're 18, you know, and, right, and just getting to college. I mean, it is crazy to think about that. And that's why this is so neat. You know, as much as us old guys talk to the younger generation and say, oh, uh, they don't make them like they used to. And, you know, oh, OK, the 2022 Ravens defense was good, but they, they were no 2000 group. And, and there's a reason why they legally they couldn't be that kind of group. Uh, but for them to get a chance to kind of see that come to life in, in a way different than just watching you know, the, the old games on YouTube or whatever, it's pretty special. So, uh, I mean, I really, really enjoyed Oh, that, that, that trip down, through memory, you know, down memory lane for a two hour stretch. And I thought it was funny, even though uh, Trent Dilfer talking about the playbook being stolen. I mean, that, that wasn't brand new, but him mentioning that Greg Williams literally admitted it to him uh, at some point in time, uh, you know, after the fact, it, it's pretty incredible and pretty nice bragging rights. When you think about it, that you could say, you guys stole our playbook and we still beat you. I mean, that's that's pretty good right there when you think about it. And you know, one thing I'll say, and I've said this before, I'll continue to say it because I don't want it to be forgotten. Ravens Titans was truly Ravens Steelers before Ravens Steelers became Ravens Steelers. I mean, it was that bitter. Those teams hated each other and it, it was so evident. And, you know, as much as Ravens Steelers has even become uh, about mutual respect and that's fine. You know, I mean, I get it, and, but it was so bitter. And, and and that was just such a fun rivalry. And I'll continue to say it was a bummer that you know when they did realignment in 2002 that they broke up the Ravens and the Titans because it would have been fun to see if that had some some of the same staying power. And you know, it's not as though they haven't renewed it on a couple occasions, uh, you know, especially here recently. But just to see that and the, the clip, uh, you know, of Billick in the post game locker room and turning the cameras off and bleep the Titans. I mean. That's some good stuff. And I mean, you don't you don't see very much of that today. And that's why I've kind of chuckled here over the last month or so where you know people have taken such exception to the Bengals and, and you know, their trash talking and, and, and how brash they've been and all of that. And it's just like, boy, you, you look at them compared to what the Ravens were uh, 20 plus years ago. I mean, they're choir boys. So it, it really is uh, a reminder of you know how much things have changed and you know, that's okay. You know, you don't want to live into the past in the past, but it is okay to go back and remember. And, and that's what Sunday night gave us an opportunity to do. And, and it was a heck of a lot of fun. Coach Billick says, uh, once you try to win a Super Bowl, they'll try to take it away from you, but um, you know, they, they, they'll try, you know, and uh, they'll try, but 22 years later, it's still, they're making documentaries about that team that I wrote in a book back six weeks after they had won that they would be considered the greatest defense in the history of the game. And I think time now, a quarter of a century, that even Troy Palomalo and Steelers would agree. And you could say, you know, the 70s Steelers and the Steel Curve, they, they, you know, purple people eaters, wherever you want. But statistically, we're a quarter of a century out. And as Brian Billy pointed out in the documentary, I mean, 10 points a game, 10 points a game, over 16 games, 17 games, eventually it'll be 18 games, that they'll have to amortize that. Um, it doesn't feel realistic in the modern game that that's ever going to be topped. Um, and because of that, it's been 22 years. And I don't think there's, if you gave me Vegas odds right now on the, you know, on the app and we could get our $200 free and play the game, the odds that somebody will ever beat that probably not good. Certainly not good this year or any year. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the shutouts, uh, the, the fact that they gave up, what, a little over 10 points per game. I mean, it's just, it's extraordinary. And even, and you know me, I'll nerd it up here for a moment. I, I know, you know, if, if there's been a statistical critique uh, of what the Ravens did in 2000 in the regular season, uh, it would, it fairly pointed out, they didn't exactly face a murderer's row of opposing quarterbacks that year, but. Even you know DVOA and Football Outsiders. Don't talk Aaron, bad about Spurgeon win like no, that. Let me let me be clear. Let me let me finish. <laughs> what they did in the postseason, 
absolutely remarkable. I mean, it, it's still it's crazy because you knew it, and, and you're it's not surprising. But when you heard Ray Lewis go down the possession chart for the Giants in the Super Bowl, punt, 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 interception, punt, you know, just going down the entire list. And we know, I mean, it was a shutout other than a uh, Ron Dixon's kick return for the touchdown uh, in the second half. But uh, I mean, it's it's astonishing what they did on that stage. And for as much as we celebrate, and rightfully so, what Joe Flacco did as a quarterback in the 2012 postseason, what the Ravens' defense, as great as they were in the regular season, to be that much greater in the postseason was just remarkable. I mean, you know, they, they and they even talked about it in that divisional game against Tennessee. Hey, Titans put together a heck of an opening drive. They marched right down the field, and Eddie George ran on them even, you know, and they did some boots with Steve McNair and whatnot. But other than that, uh, I mean – no one did anything against them of consequence oh, offensively. I mean, you know, you can Hall think of Famer it. Troy Aikman, nada. Yeah. yeah. That, that. Uh, I mean, it's just, uh, but, but it's just, uh, it really, what a remarkable group. Uh, I mean, the, the personalities, you know, uh, shine through and, and, uh, and obviously it was great to see some of the hard knock stuff. How about the fact they brought Tim Johnson back to, to do the Shannon Sharp impersonation at the event, which I had not heard that, or if I had, I'd forgotten it. I mean, that's cool, but I mean, it's not like he was, it's not like he became a notable player for them or anything. He was just, you know, a camp guy uh, as part of the talent show, but you know, the personalities, but boy, and this is where I, I made the comparison to the Bengals. The Ravens backed it up. <laughs> you know, they went on and, and they won it all and uh, they won it all in emphatic fashion. And, I think what was so fun about that run, and I even threw it out there on Twitter, uh, after the Ravens beat the Titans uh, in the divisional round, regardless of what CBS or ESPN or whoever was saying as far as breaking down that Ravens-Raiders game, I don't think there was, other than just the fans who always want to worry about something, I don't think there was a single Ravens fan who actually thought they weren't going to win that game in Oakland. I, I think everyone thought from the moment Ray Lewis takes the ball away from Eddie George, uh, and they beat the Titans. Oh, I said we're going to the Super Bowl. It's you first knew they were going to the Super right Bowl. Moment, it's just yes. gonna be a matter. Yeah, it's just gonna be a matter of who do they play, the Giants or, or Minnesota. Uh, I mean, that's really what you know. That's what it came down to at that point. Uh, for me, I mean, I always, I always think back to. For me, Ray Lewis taking the ball away from Eddie George was just the exclamation point. For me, the moment I knew was Anthony Mitchell, who ninety-eight percent of Ravens fans had no idea who he was. He was backup safety who played special teams. He returns the block field goal for the touchdown. That was the moment for me that I, I, I vividly remember saying to my dad at the time, sitting in our living room, we're winning the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> I mean, I, that's how confident I was as a 17 year old Ravens fan who seeing my first playoff games, you know, uh, for, for my team, uh, my hometown team. And I, that's how confident I was. And you know, it was just going to be a matter of, how they did it. I mean, I, I thought it was cute to hear the the talking heads leading up to the AFC championship game, talking about the Raiders vaulted running game that they were going to be able to run against the Ravens. It's like, get out of here with that. If you're going to do anything against the Ravens, you know, you might complete a pass or two here or there, spread them out, dink and dunk, maybe get, get someone to miss a tackle, but you didn't run on that group at all. I mean, that's where go back to the analytics. I was mentioning that run defense, boy. I mean, it's as, historically dominant as anything you'll see uh, in the history of the NFL that, I mean, what they gave up, I think it was 2.8 yards per carry that season. I mean, that's just, that's silly. I mean, that is absolutely silly. You know, what's crazy is I was going through all this radio row stuff and the Super Bowl 35 radio row. I had the radio station, but I was syndicated nationally at that time. Was I was syndicated for two Super Bowls. That was one of them. And so I was down there working for Sporting News Radio on a big set where I, I just found the tapes. And the tapes they gave me were VHS because they taped six hours. The show was four hours long. So I have Baldy TSN, you know, uh, uh, Super Bowl XXX, you know, V Tampa Thursday. Friday, and I went through the the segments, and I found Bonnie Bernstein, who I had still have a great crush on, and I love Bonnie, and I've just always loved doing radio with Bonnie when she's been on my show and whatnot back in the day. But she was a big shot. I mean, she was doing Super Bowl on the broadcast, mm-hmm. the whole deal, right? She was in the in the 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 movie 
with Billick asking him about the first half. He said, anything I say to you is going to be up on that screen in a minute. And he said that to Bonnie. So yeah. two weeks later, Bonnie's with me and Baldinger doing the national show. We held her two segments, but she's from Jersey and grew up a Giants fan. Mm -hmm. And obviously he's a terp, right? But I went after her real good because she said she was doing the Giants. And I think I said to her five times in interview, it's going to, what's it going to be like being in the losing locker room? What's that going to be like for you? <laughs> and, you know, I said that several times. So you're going to hear that this week. So there will be a little serendipity in all of this madness with uh, uh, WNST and my life's work being boxed out of Radio Row this week for the first time in 27 years. Uh, Luke, it will be on the set and around and ready for all things baseball and spring training. And whenever uh, John Angelos opens the books, Luke, I hope that I'm anointed the <laughs> WNST representative. There's a lot lying our asses off, aren't they? But we still have the purple afterglow of Super Bowl 35 and the memories and thoughts of Goose and uh, watching the bullies of Baltimore. And uh, I'll be presenting a whole bunch of conversations in and around that, some epic sort of conversations from that week. Luke, so I've gone through um, – the list of the, the guests that I actually have found, and, and there's 232 pieces, I think, that are going to air this week. The ones I can't find are the ones that really piss me off. And you know this, right? Because you know me in the real world. So I, mm -hmm. I, I think I have found The Rock from Houston, 2004. Uh, I have no idea where John Heater uh, from uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, he sat down with me with the bobblehead. We did a whole segment with the bobblehead in 2006 <laughs> in Detroit. I have pictures of me with Shannon Sharp and Lennox Lewis together when Lennox Lewis was like the champion um, in Detroit, like in 06. And they did 15 minutes on the set with me together. I can't find the tape. Um, David Copperfield did the show with me, made the prediction Raven Super Bowl week on the set. Um, Jennifer Garner, can't find that interview. Uh, Kevin Green joined me at the Super Bowl 2002. Gave me a hard time about being a Raven fan when he was a Steeler. Uh, I've lost my Jerry Glanville a conversation from Miami 1999. and uh, But I, I am mixing down Vanilla Ice, Christian Okoye, uh, a, a double shot of Rod Woodson and Michael Haynes, two Hall of Famers at the same time. That was kind of mm -hmm. fun. Um, uh, i got to read my own writing. Tony Baselli who has since joined the Hall of Fame. The great Stacey Keebler, one-time WNST intern Stacey Keebler, uh, and also sold Get Nasty t-shirts at Whiskey Joe's on Super Bowl Sunday. So there's another 35 reference for you with Keebler because she was my intern. Then. She was actually Miss Hancock then, but it's a long story. And then the Matt burke Tory Smith interview that you and I did a couple years ago. So I'm, I'm finding lost pieces of all sorts of things across all sorts of spectrum. So you know what you're going to have to do, Luke, for your mama and your sister and your brother who weren't around before 2009 and I was already 14 Super Bowls deep in? They can go back and hear all the remnants of all these great conversations with Yanni in 2004 or Joe Montana in 2009 or Jerome Bettis in 2004 three when he was spinning my Super Bowl ring and wanting and hoping and then admitting <laughs> in the next segment that he never did it. So uh, you'll have a chance to hear all of that all week long here as we present best of Super Bowl Radio Row. How was that for a promo? Was that good? That was good. That was good. I, I, I felt it. Absolutely. Well, you and me and Diamond Dallas Page. What's yeah. your favorite Radio Row interview that you've done? Because you've been a part of 200 of them, 300 of them. Yeah. Boy, putting me on the spot. I mean, that one was any anything we've done with pro wrestlers it's always the there. ones you don't get you're pissed about charlotte flair and i'm yeah. still pissed about the backstreet boys yeah yeah absolutely uh you know i mean it's just it you take it for granted when you're there because it's you know it's a long week and it's a lot there's a lot going on but you know, when you start to count up the number of hall of famers you and i've had an opportunity to talk to and, and you many more than me having done it longer than me that, that's pretty cool. You know, when you think about it and, you know, it, it's obviously it resonates more when it's someone Baltimore, you know, the sitting down with us, but I got to find think... Joe Delamin there. Cause he taught me how to say his name. There you go. Before he there went into go. the hall of fame. You're mentioning hall of famers. Like we had Andre Tippett. We had John Randall. We've had Orlando Pace. I mean, I'm just Derek Brooks sat down with us. Barry Sanders. Is, uh, that's another missing one. 2006, Barry Sanders, who never talked famously sat down and was the nicest guy in the world to me in Detroit, you know? So, uh, I've had him on a couple of times. I've, I I found pictures of me and Lynn Swan. I don't remember talking to Lynn Swan, but he I did. I have pictures of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'll give you another one. And this one's kind of low key because it's after the fact. 
how many years did we talk to Jerry Kramer about finally, you know, his Hall of Fame credentials, and then he finally gets in? And, and you think about that. I mean, and 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 every town has their guy, right? In in some sport, who hasn't made it to the Hall of Fame? That yeah, we've got Art Modell. For. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, it, we'll, we'll be talking about Marshall Yonda until he gets in. Well, you know, exactly. I mean, we'll just you know, who, Suggs whoever, too. Yeah, Suggs. I mean, absolutely. You know, well, un- until Justin Tucker gets in, all that. But every town has one or two guys, and you know, especially when it's someone who it's been a long time for. You know, we sat down with Jerry Kramer, and I feel like I'm sure I probably asked him about the Hall of Fame at least once, if not a couple different years. And then for him to finally get the nod, and, and I, I don't think we've talked to him since then. You know, I, I, uh, you know, it was just a few years ago when he when he was inducted. So I don't think we had a chance to interview him after the fact. But you know, that that's pretty neat when you really think about that. And and it's it's crazy and it's rapid fire sometimes. But the number of Hall of Famers you get a chance to talk to and athletes from other sports, all of that. I mean, it's tough. I'd have to really sit down. I'd need. Frankly, I would need a list to go through. And... Well, I'm going to provide that list for you, yeah. Baltimore Positive, this week. How there you go. That? Exactly. So I, I, you know, my my that was a long explanation for saying I don't really know, but so there, my favorite some great interview ones. was Mary Lou Retton. Okay. Like I would yeah. just say that I really loved that time with her. It was fun. She was mm-hmm. so cool. She was into it. She was digging it. Um, and I think that the work we did with Billy Cundiff, that was um, good. Right. Was amazing. I mean, yeah. Billy Cundiff came and sat and talked to us, just sat down with us for a while. And yeah. um, I thought you were great with Anquan Bolden in Miami a couple of years. I mean, look, I can go through. I'm plugging sure. now. I mean, literally just plugging. But if you put our radio station on this week and you're hearing this, you're going to hear some shit. That's all I'm saying. I mean, you're going to no hear doubt. stuff that you haven't heard, that conversations you may have recollected from 2004 because you were in the car the day I had The Rock on or the day I had Mike Dick on or the day Deion Sanders sat down with me in 2004. Uh, I, like, it, it really, it, it's amazing, you know, the, the, the body of work. And I want to present it for people this week in a week when uh, we have been unceremoniously locked out and I'll, you know, I'll deal with that in due time. But in the meantime, it's Super Bowl week and I want people to uh, to come to the station and, and come to the website and have a good experience and experience the depth of the work we've done. And it's it's significant and been doing it ever since. Brian Billick won the Super Bowl and Ray Lewis won the Super Bowl and Tony Saragusa. So, and we're still here doing it. Uh, let's see, 35, it's 50, it's 22 years later, right? So I got to add, do the math on Super Bowl XX. We're into the L's now. There's no X's anymore. I always write Super Bowl X and I look up, I'm like, shit, X's have been gone for almost eight years now. So we're L-V-I-I. Did you know that? Yeah. Uh, well, and this is the 10 year anniversary. And, and obviously this past Friday was the, the 10th anniversary of Super Bowl 47. So you, you mentioned, I mean, that's, I'm the same way, whatever the context is of Super Bowl 35 and 47. And you know, I, I'd, I'd even go back to Super Bowl 25, which was Giants Bills, you know, and Whitney Houston doing her thing and you know, Scott Norwood missing the field goal at the end. But that's, for me, that's probably the first Super Bowl that I really have a, a strong memory of. You know, I, I can remember the 49ers, you know, bits and pieces of it the year before, but that Bills Giants Super Bowl, that, that was my first Super Bowl that I really remember as what a seven year old at the time. So my first you know, that, Super Bowl that I remember were the Dolphins. Yeah. So I mean the undefeated Dolphins in 72, 73, 74, the Colts getting out of the way and Marty Dommers. I've been through that, but yeah, man, it's been a lot of Super Bowl Sunday, so uh, we'll be taking this one off Crazy. this week, but we'll have a good time around here, and folks tuning in will hear the history of the game, really, literally. I think that's something No we question present. about it. Lot, yeah. Lots of great conversations, and you know, I mean, we'll, we'll watch the game just like everyone else come uh, the, this coming Sunday, but plenty to, to look back on and uh, lots of great Ravens conversations mixed in there. And maybe even an offensive coordinator before it's all over. With Luke Jones is at Baltimore. At Luke, some point, you, yeah, <laughs> it's going to happen. The purple flume, plumes of smoke are going to be flying out when the, when this <laughs> happens. Uh, all of our WNST coverage and our crab cake tour brought to you by our friends at the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with Window Nation. Reminder again: eight six six ninety Nation. Uh, you buy two, you get two free. It's a simple deal. But you get two years free financing. They had five for a while. It's two right now. Still a great deal. Take advantage of it. Call 866-90-NATION. For all 
all of our sponsors and the people that have put us on the road for 28 years doing Super Bowls. Uh, please accept my apologies that I'm not there this week. It is not uh, for uh, my lack of effort or my lack of integrity or my lack of uh, wanting to be out there and having a flight and having rooms and uh, watching with my nose pressed up to the glass uh, like a gall dang amateur. Uh, I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. Super Bowl 35 because it's fun and we won. Stay with us.